Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Aaron Katz is one of the most distinct directors in independent film with movies like Cold Weather, Quiet City, Land Ho, and now Gemini, starring our guests, John Cho and Laura Kirk. It's a kind of murder mystery set in Los Angeles and the trappings of fame. Let's take a look at the trailer. Sorry to bother you. I'm a big fan of Heather's. You're her assistant, right? Yeah. I just, I had to come up and say hello. Heather, right here. Heather, Heather, right here. Hey, Heather. Yeah, how's the love life? Huh? I got nothing to tell you, Sam. Do you have alcohol at your place? Why are we here? You have a gun, right? I feel like there's so many crazy people who are mad at me right now. You know how to shoot a gun? How many movies have I shot guns in? Two. You know how you were saying you don't feel safe? I feel like that all the time. I felt like you're feeling right now. Which is why it's so tough for me to ask you what I've got to ask you. What do you have to ask me? You remember things, am I right? I think you might remember things more than most people. Think back. What is the last thing you saw in this house? Did she ever threaten you? Or... No, she didn't threaten me. Because I've heard stories about movie stars. Who... Am I under arrest? Not yet. Motive, opportunity, capacity. You two were like freaking best friends. People like that kill each other all the time. Are you following me? I'm asking you to be careful. You might not think something's important and then bingo. It's the key to the whole thing. Everybody, please welcome John Cho, Laura Kirk, and director Aaron Katz. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for being here. Hello. Uh, congratulations on the film. I loved it. Uh, as I was telling you before backstage, I, I, I really love your work. I really love the progression of your career that we've seen, and I feel like you've sort of been moving uh, sort of at your own pace into a genre film, and this is kind of sort of your first step into that. Uh, cold weather kind of there. So what was it like for you, I think, uh, adapting your style and, and how you like to make movies and the movies you like to see into a kind of murder mystery? Well, it was really bringing a couple of threads together um, that I was separately interested in. And one is just uh, I'm a fan of uh, reading detective novels and watching thrillers, especially thrillers from the 80s and 90s. And why, I, why that why that period of time? I, I, uh, I really I saxophones. Feel, yeah, saxophones mostly. <laughs> I mean, it's funny because we I, I recently rewatched um, The Long Goodbye, which I like a lot, but it feels like it's of an era just slightly before the era I'm most inspired by. And I really think of Body Heat and American Gigolo as kicking off this era. And, and maybe it's partly nostalgia for VHS and, and, and growing up watching tapes. Um, but also, I kind of like that at that time, those kinds of movies were regarded as almost like B-movies. They weren't taken seriously a, as art. And so I think it gives them a lot of freedom and freewheelingness. And, and, and in fact, I think many of them are very good movies and, and, and films like Curtis Hansen's Bad Influence and uh, Poison Ivy and Wild Drew Barrymore Things. Poison Ivy? Yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. Or the, I can't remember who's in the, in the sequel, Poison Ivy 2. Um, anyway. <laughs> No, that's no, the crush. She's in the um, crush, which um, is the, also the, very good. The actress that looks exactly like Margot Robbie. Alyssa Milano. Yes. Oh, is it yes, Alyssa Milano? Alyssa oh, there's Milano. a third one that has Ooh, the actress. Who's the that one looks that looks like Margot, like Margot Robbie. Robbie? Jamie Priestley. Is that her name? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody, with a Cinemax subscription. <laughs> <laughs> this is like Family Feud when people are like calling out to uh... men with '90s Cinemax subscriptions. <laughs> So, so that was kind of one side of it. And the other is just an interest in having space to watch fully realized characters interacting with each other. And so those two things really came together in this movie. Right. Law, how was, the, uh, how was the film pitched to you? What did, what did you think when you first heard about it? Well, I was really excited about updating the noir genre. Um, and I, I hesitate to use this term, but is it like mumblecore? 
Oh, what no. is? I'm sorry. No, because someone. I actually. I, I'm very uh, fuzzy on what the actual definition of that is. But I, I loved how I got the script that was really couched in one kind of genre, but also had these elements of like actual conversation that people would have. And I've always loved thrillers and mysteries. I watched a lot of court TV growing up, and it was really exciting to me to see the world weary uh, male detective kind of uh, substituted with me instead. We do have a sort of weir- world-weary male detective, though, in this film. True. <laughs> Would you say that's your character? He's kind of the, the he's the one that is questioning everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I, I was saying that I uh, enjoyed playing this detective because he's he's uh, rather unknowable, and um, I, and it's a guessing game as to what he's really thinking, what his real background is, and. Um, and he is uh, just as uh, slippery as any other character in the film. And he's, um, I don't know what, what he says is true, whether he, you saw in the, the trailer, he says, I, I know what you're going through. I'm not sure if that's true. I don't know whether, what his intentions are at the end of the movie when he returns. Um, you know, uh, so it's, it's interesting because he's trying to give as little of himself as possible and, and, maximize the information that he's gathering. But what I love about his character is that he's sort of obviously doing the right thing that his character should do. The path that he's going on and what he's chasing is sort of the obvious thing that the police detective should do, but you're sort of against him in some way because you're so with your character throughout the film. Um, can you talk about going back to this sort of mumblecore thing? I, I'm sorry. sorry. I, I wouldn't yeah, have. Thanks. I, I wouldn't have brought it up if you. <laughs> no, but I do think I do think there's something to uh, you know the great detective film, a great noir film, involves you in conversations where the clues that come up later aren't very obvious early on, and I think that's where sort of your background and having people talk very naturally really uh, is a benefit to you in this film because for the first act of the movie, we aren't really. Everything that's being laid out isn't obvious at all. It feels like natural conversation. Yeah, all the pieces are there in the in the first act of the movie, but they're all there through Lola's relationship with with Zoe's character, and and things are layered in that become important later. And that's everything from learning about people's relationships to starting to understand the geography of certain places that will become important later, like the apartment where uh, Lola's character lives in, and, and the house that Heather's character lives in. And I always feel like. Um, the very best kinds of um, setups for mystery films make you uh, feel that you, you're, you're learning things without, you, you don't even realize that you're learning things that are going to be relevant later. What made you want to tell the story of a, uh, of a star, a Hollywood star and her, her assistant? It's, it's always such a fascinating relationship. Yeah, well, I'd been living in Los Angeles for about two and a half years when I wrote this script, and I'd moved to the city without knowing really what I would think of it, and so I, over time, grew to love the city and felt like I needed to to write a movie that was set there, and I also had... Um, various encounters with people who have this job and uh paid best friends paid best friends uh yeah and it's just uh, it was a really interesting relationship to me because it's um the the line between personal and professional is very porous and it seems like uh just had a great opportunity as a basis for a movie uh that that went in the direction that this movie does Lola, did you think of any assistants that you've been around or, or friends who have personal assistants that while you were playing this character? I thought of my dream of what a personal assistant would be. Someone who would <laughs> find your killer. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I didn't base it on anyone in particular, though. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your character's relationship to uh, Zoe's character in terms of uh, where that line between friend and uh, employee is? Well, I, I think that there's something really fascinating about having such a wide reach as as the kind of movie star Heather is. Um, and your life is really big in a lot of ways, but it's actually really, really small because of our society's relationship to fame and the necessity for you to just be really private because everything these days is public information. So I think Jill... Um, it is, is many things. She's an assistant. She's the best friend. She's a mother of sorts. She's the the manager. Um, and I, I'm just I, I I'm I'm just kind of blown away by the ways in which um, we we treat celebrities and, and and the way that people have to kind of 
um, as John has been saying, and I've been stealing this from him, self this like self infantilization that a lot of these um, that a lot of these people have to kind of do because they can't do things for themselves because people will go nuts. Yeah, yeah I I I've been thinking also recently that it's. Um, the movie can be read a number of ways, but one is like this sort of uh, a meditation on intimacy, and it's it's interesting because uh, Heather Zoe's character is um, creates this illusion of intimacy with millions of people, and then in reality she requires the intimacy. It's hard to find, and she has this with an employee who. Um, is both friend and servant, but, and she also requires t the intimacy, even though the fan comes and she needs to push her away, but she also needs the validation from the Instagram, and uh, it, it, you know, it, it gets complicated now, all these relationships, because of um, the availability of fame through social media and, and the, the availability of connections that weren't there before. Um, Aaron, one of the, I think, m big differences between a movie, a thriller that's made today, or a thriller like Gemini, and the ones that you're kind of referencing is, is budget. You know, there was this 80s and 90s, those thrillers were pretty well-budgeted movies, and it's kind of impossible to get a thriller like that made at something like that. So I feel like you kind of captured uh, the thriller style incredibly well, but how did you do that on, with, with the resources that you had? Not that you were a low-budget film or anything, but... Yeah, well, I mean, it starts with really great producers. Um, so we had three producers on this movie who um, just made the most of the resources that we had. And, and shooting in Los Angeles can be very difficult because no, no one thinks it's cool that you're shooting a movie and everyone knows what their parking lot and their locations are worth. Um, but it just requires uh, um, that much more dedication to finding great locations to making sure we have the time we need to, to shoot the scenes. Uh, and yeah, I, I mean, there really aren't at the studio level a lot of movies that fit in the same space as like Jagged Edge or, or Sliver. Um, and Sliver. <laughs> we watched it on VHS. Did you really? Yeah, to prepare. That's the one with William Baldwin and Sharon Stone, right? Yeah. I'm and, so impressed by you right now. And Tom, thank you. And Tom Berenger? Is Tom Berenger in that? I believe he is, yes. yes. And the tagline is something along the lines of like, the view from the building is nothing compared to the view of the building or in the building and or something this, like this, that. This is weird, but is that another movie where William Baldwin's character is recording himself sleeping with women? Because that would be the second after Flatliners. I think Sorry. he's only recording people. Now I actually don't remember what the resolution- He's recording is. other people. Oh yeah. no, he's recording himself sleeping with women. That's so weird, because that's like two movies within the course of like three years where that's his primary. He got typecasted. <laughs> <laughs> if you do something really well. Yes. Right. That was why he didn't get the Sex, Lies, and Videotape job, too. They were just right. like, oh, you already had this. I mean, there was just, you know, like, there were, like, superstar writers of thrillers like Joe Esterhaus um, with Basic Instinct and, and Sliver and, and so on. And... Uh, I, 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 from my perspective, as just an audience member, forget being a filmmaker, I think it's unfortunate that we don't get this movie that much. Of course, we occasionally get something like Gone Girl or Girl on the Train, but... Um, we get, like, one every few years yeah. rather than, like, a genre a year. That's kind of... And often those are book adaptations of an already very popular book and not original concepts. Like, there is no... You know, the, the sort of legendary sale of, of base of the basic instinct script, which I think at the time sold for more money than any script previously, and you just would not hear that about a, a, a thriller. And I think in part that's because, uh, you know, at the studios, I think there's a lot of quality work going on in franchises, but also a lot of work that's not that great. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that it's all about brands and not about, in, in some cases, not about creating great movies. So It's also about reliability, right? I mean, it's the same thing goes with the mid-budget mid comedy. You can't reliably bet on a mid-budget comedy to come out great, one, and two, to make a lot of money. And so for all of the thrillers that we like of the 90s, there were a bunch of thrillers that were not very good, that were, you know, trying to be basic instinct. Or I don't even think Sliver did very well. No, I it was also a rabbit hole conversation that you've dragged <laughs> yeah, me into. I'm, sorry. I'm really sorry. Are, we're completely out of time here, so... <laughs> 
probably meant for the green room, not like, not on stage. Uh, John, your your character, the detective, has uh, I think you have as an actor, you have so much to do in kind of so few scenes, and what you have to present, and where he's coming from, and what he distrusts. What's that like going into those scenes? Do you kind of just rely on the writing to do it, or do you do a lot? Mostly, of you rely on the writing. Yeah, that was. Um I don't recall any improvisation. I think that was all written, but you know, um, it's all there if you give it some thought. And it's, uh, th I think the trick is, as I said, uh, he's just n n trying not to reveal <laughs> anything about himself. And it will, all he's trying to do is, uh, as I was saying uh, uh, in an interview before, he was, he's just like a doctor who's, who's, um, who's got his little mallet and is looking for the, the the leg to shoot up when he hits the right spot. And he, so he's just picking spots here and there. Um, and all the while trying not to reveal anything. And that's a fun character to play. One of the things I enjoy about watching your performance in this movie, John, is the- Lay it on me, Aaron. <laughs> is the, is, you know, you're in a, uh, a few scenes that are quite long and watching the variation in pace and, and the use that your character makes of silences and, and, and sometimes like asking a question, another question and another question and then letting things hang. And I, I think that's such a, um, yeah, an interesting way to approach it and something well, that, that, I enjoy that, cutting. I will say I will return the compliment by saying uh, it was one of the fun ways, Aaron's a, a, an interesting filmmaker in that you know we, we were doing full scenes on each take and that reveals different things and it lets us play with pace rather than, and, and you know, it, it, and it's an interesting storytelling uh, method because he has on each take a full uh, scene available to him. And so what he doesn't do is go in, pop in for close-ups and inserts to constantly tell you, the viewer, what to think and what you should be thinking um, so that it makes for a very active viewing experience, in my opinion, which I really love. So when I'm watching our film, I'm guessing, uh, and my mind wanders, what's she thinking, what is he thinking, what, 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 what's the truth here, uh, rather than being told and just consuming it passively. Yeah. What is that like? I mean, do are most actors uh, happy with doing a, a full takes like that, rather than popping in for close-ups here and there? think so Lola what do you think it's 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 rare and I think a real privilege to be able to do the full scene yeah, there's a wonderful scene I mean there's a lot of wonderful scenes in the film but uh with you and uh Zoe Kravitz in the in the car and it just sort of holds on you in the passenger seat while she's driving and I, I just love that shot for some reason Zoe's talking a lot but we never really cut to Zoe she's out of focus the whole time and it's all about your reactions to her what are you thinking about when you're shooting a scene like that where it's like when's lunch Right, right, no. right. <laughs> no. <laughs> when can we get it's in late. and out? <laughs> Night shoots go late. <laughs> um, well, no, I think that you're just doing the scene, you know. Um, and you don't necessarily pay attention to where the camera is or ask those questions a lot of the time? Well, or? I mean, I, I feel like I should maybe pay more attention to where the camera is because I feel like part of being, like, a screen actor that you don't really have when you're on stage is, like, knowing what your angles are. It's this very strange thing where it's, like, I, I, you shouldn't really care about how you look all the time, but like, there is it. There is, I think, a, a real skill to being a screen actor and like being like really good at what you're doing and looking good at the same time. And I would like to spend more time learning how to do that. Stick with me, kid. <laughs> okay. I mean, one thing that we did is uh, uh, our director of photography and I really would engineer shots and engineer spaces so that actors wouldn't need to worry about that. And we often would find ways to back the camera off a little and maybe get on a, a, a little bit of a longer lens for a tighter shot without the camera physically being closer to, to the actors. And Why? Because I, I, especially when we're doing these full takes, I think having the, the sense that you can just live in these moments and, and, and live a, a, a fictitious life for the you know, five to seven minutes of the take. Your, uh, the score of this film is by Keegan DeWitt, uh, again, who you've worked with a few times and has uh, done a, a lot of stuff. I love the score of the film. What were some of the influences behind it? What did you talk to him about? Or did you just show him Sliver and say, do that? I said, yeah, I said, do, watch Sliver, watch Jade, and we're done. Hey. <laughs> um, and uh, no, I, we actually started Caruso, in, in kind sorry. of a different, yeah, Caruso, Linda Fiorentino. Um, 
we we started with this idea that we wanted to uh, to sort of pay homage to Giorgio Moroder and Tangerine Dream and other um, scores that we love from from the late seventies through the eighties, uh, and we went in that direction. And what we realized when we got deeper into it. Uh, something happened that had never happened to us before, which is that we felt that we needed to like rethink things and, and, and change it up. And so, why? Well, we couldn't figure it out for a long time. We kept watching cuts of the oh, movie. Wow. Something felt off. And what we realized was that it spoke to the genre of the film, but it did not speak to the characters that are in the film. And and it wow. and it felt like it was detached and and was only uh, attached to like the style of the movie. And it was really important for us to feel like this score could only exist in like right now, could only be a contemporary score and, and, and that it was a mistake to live in nostalgia. So now the score does kind of reference what it felt to turn on Showtime in the early 1990s, but it also feels like it couldn't have existed at any time previously, and we hope that it feels like music that the characters might want to listen to and, and feels like it expresses something about driving around in Los Angeles right now. Yeah. Um, going back to Jade for a second. Please. <laughs> Is that movie any good? I don't it, remember. It's amazing. We just uh, is it really? So we did a triple feature with Gemini of Jade, Dead Again, and Gemini in, in, at the Alamo Draft House in, in San Francisco, and it is great on the big screen. I think it, uh, Friedkin, for, it's right? Friedkin, and it doesn't get nearly as much love as French Connection or To Live and Die in L.A. I think it is just as great a film as either of those two, and it looks amazing on the big screen. And I highly recommend that people revisit Jade. Those are tough words. I'm a diehard Live and Die in L.A. fan. I don't I mean, know the, if I can go. The car chase in Jade is very. There's there's a part of it that that's of course because because I mean that's Friedkin. like Friedkin's thing, right? I wonder if he wanted to do all those car chases or if it was like, all right, fine, I'll do a car chase. Just give me the money. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, it's weird. It's a weird trademark to have, and the and uh, he hated directing them. He always said. Well, he does it very well. Or, yeah, Jade, I think half of the car chase doesn't work that well. There's, like, this sort of center portion that I don't love, but the beginning and the end of the car chase in Jade is, like, maybe one of the best ends to any car chase. I might have to go watch Jade tonight. Let's get some questions from the audience. What do we got? <laughs> Hi. Um, I just have one question. So when creating um, Lola's character, what specific person or uh, movie or anything did you draw inspiration from? Hmm. Um, if anything, Lola. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't know Lola at the time, but I, I wrote the film with, with her in mind. I'd seen a film called Mistress America that she's in, and I felt very excited to hopefully work with Lola, and I didn't know what she would be like as a person, really. I only knew her from that performance, um, but we reached out with a very early draft, and so Lola and I spent a lot of time um, talking about the movie, and we would get together and um, and I would revise based on our conversations. Um, so yeah, I don't think there is any one movie or or even circumstance. I mean, there's little bits of truth all, all throughout the movie from my experiences and Lola's and, and Zoe's, um, but a lot of it is just kind of our imagination and, and building from that seed into something um, else. And just to add to that, something that we had been discussing was why Jill had found herself in this career. And it seemed kind of strange because she has this background where she went to Andover and she is like this overachiever and yet she's someone's assistant. And something that we had decided was that she was just a film lover and that she just wanted to be in this business in some capacity, not because she cared about celebrity, but because of movies. And so there was a costume that I wear like in most of the film that we were like, oh, this is totally Katherine Hepburn. It's like the I did like slacks in a yellow jumper, and it looks very like Katherine Hepburn going to play golf or something. Um, and it was really fun to find these moments where we could insert her love of like cinema into what she was doing. That also explains a little bit, without uh, sort of over explaining it in the film, but her her sort of voyeurism and her interest in following through on this rather than doing what most people would do, which is being like, get me the hell out of here, sort of going down this path. She's almost living in her own movie at that point. I like that. Well, one thing that I, it's funny, I hadn't thought about this lately, but before we made the film, I was thinking about how if any of us encountered a, a situation like this, mostly we would be informed by movies and not real experience, and especially someone who was immersed in, in that world 
Um, like even when you're talking to Zoe's character and like her qualifications for like, it's okay that you're gonna give me a gun is I've shot a gun in two movies before. Um, and so both like as, as a watcher and a participant in movies, I think are, you know, many of our brains are like filled with these ways that you imagine you might do things. Now, of course, a lot of people, it were the situation to arise might, might um, decide that the police were better suited to, to handle it. But, but I think uh, it's a lot of uh, fun to explore um, uh, if someone did sort of allow their, their information from, from fictional circumstances to apply to real life. Uh, next question, right there. Hi, I'm a big fan of the Harold and Kumar movies, but I wanted to ask the two of you, uh, do you guys prefer more serious roles over comedic roles, and is there a slight chance of maybe another Harold and Kumar movie? <laughs> I feel like the first question was perfunctory. <laughs> <laughs> Just Write your congressman and uh, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> I'll tackle the second question first. I don't know whether there'll be a Harold and Kumar 4, um, but... I the way you said 4 makes me think no. <laughs> <laughs> Four? It sounds crazy, that, you know. Uh, well, no, I, I think I, as I was saying four, it sounded so ridiculous because there are it, the the idea of sequels was is these sequels extending beyond three is very new. Um, that it's it's crazy to think there would be a fourth Harold and Kumar, but I would love to do one. Um, so if you have a few million bucks, I'll go make one. Um, and then as far as comedy or drama, uh, I do very much enjoy both. Uh, and, um, but I don't, I don't really think about that as much as I do. Is this uh, character fun? Is this gonna be a good time? And do I like the people? I feel the exact same way. <laughs> Is there going to, uh, you might be in the fourth I, Harold yeah, and Kumar? I, I will be in the fourth Harold and Kumar film. John will be replaced I would love by that. Lella. John, you were in another drama just this past year, right? Uh, Colum this, this little film, Columbus, that is, uh, look at that. Uh, an incredibly beautiful film that, that you were a part of. Um, is this sort of a new, a new direction for your career that you're going in? Um, in, in as much as, uh, I will say, uh, I was telling Aaron the other night, um, like when, when I said yes to Gemini, it was a, a, a period of my life where I, I had decided consciously, I'm not going to think so much about what I'm doing, and it's going to be, is this a movie that I would like mm -hmm. to watch, and is this a person that I would like to work with, and that is it. And um, the size of the budget, or whether my agents were saying this is viable or it's not, or this, if there's a, uh, there's a market for this. I, I just I listened to nothing else but, and it, so it was kind of like uh, uh, just saying yes to things that I really uh, felt in my heart. That's great. I think time for one more question. Hi, um, so since uh, you're all talking about uh, the film's influences from classic, um, thrillers and uh, capers, and you could clearly see it through the um, cinematography when you watched the movie, which was the best thing that I loved about it. Um, I was wondering, uh, when it came to the writing process, how much um, did the screenplay influence from uh, the classic films that you've mentioned and um, the original concept of the film itself? Yeah, um, I mean, my head was just filled with these kinds of things and, and uh, you know, some things that are in the movie, some things that aren't, but like, you know, overworked DAs who need a vacation and, uh, you know, c cops who you don't know if they're trying to exonerate you or trap you by what they're asking. And so um, with all of that kind of bouncing around in my head, I, I started um, thinking about writing a film in this genre and uh, thinking about setting it in Los Angeles and having that be really important to it. Um, but then when I started writing it, I just, I, I typically, when I write, I like to write a first draft, um, knowing maybe a few sort of um, points of what's gonna happen, like something right at the beginning, right in the middle, and where we're gonna end up. But other than that, I write, this is maybe gonna sound strange, but I try and think as little as possible and try and write instinctually. And, 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 I, and I feel like the shaping process and the editing process can be very intellectual, but for me that's something best saved to 
later and, and best to develop with actors. And, and um, I, I trust instinct in some ways more than intellect when it comes to writing. So sort of like all that was in the background and then whatever came out was a mix of that and every other experience I've had in life. Do you find you write uh, easier or is it harder for you to write with all of those influences swimming around in your head? Do you try to get them out of there when you sit down to no, write? No, I don't mind. I, be, I, I, I find that they don't tend to insert themselves directly in inconvenient ways where I realize, ah, oh, this is like exactly what's in, you know, Cruel Intentions or something. Um, um, it's more of like the world. I, somebody's, I really hope someone's making a list of all the movies he's referenced in this it one It should interview. be a viewing list to, to revisit. He has them. not repeated ones. I have. That's the best part about it, too. Isn't it? <laughs> you should see his VHS collection. I had a VHS we collection, spent and it's also gone. while talking about, how Zoe and I were talking about how neither Lola or John has ever seen Scream and how that really needs to. <laughs> I'm sorry really? I outed you guys. I was too young when it came out. It was a scary movie. I was too movie. old when it came yeah, out. Yeah, it was too old. It's very fun. It's very, it's very fun. It, it holds up, even as an adult. I've seen it. It's not, it, yeah. But if you're seven, that's scary. Yeah. <laughs> All right, fine. <laughs> Matthew Lillard's breakout role, right? I think. Yeah. Um, but no. Anyway. I, yeah. I. I. I, uh, I I, I find that it's just fun to surround yourself with that, and and the fact that my interest, sort of deepest down, is in finding out like who these characters are, makes me not too worried about getting into any sort of dead ends with um, trying to emulate these movies. I mean, when I was in film school, all I did was try and emulate movies. I thought I wanted to be. I just like made like one that was an Antonioni knockoff and one that was a Jacques Tati knockoff, and they were really stupid. Uh, and but I was 21, and it didn't matter. And um, and, and now I just feel like um, being excited about actors and being excited about telling stories about relationships overwhelms everything else. And the other stuff is just kind of fun to surround ourselves with. And that's why we watch Sliver is just to like get in. Um, get ourselves immersed in a certain kind of world, a certain way of, of, of thinking about things and have fun with it. Why do you, the film's uh, cinematography is so polished and beautiful, but you love VHS. And VHS, one of the great things that, one of the things that I love about VHS is that it looks like shit most of the time. And especially if you're watching a horror movie, like one of my favorite VHSs is Texas Chainsaw Massacre because it just looks nasty. Like, what, wh where do you draw that influence from if you're, with your cinematography being well, so polished and beautiful? I think it's in, in part due to, uh, to some of the same things I was talking about with the score, which is that we wanted it to be elegant, like some of the, like Bad Influence, which is shot by Robert Ellswit, is a very elegant and beautiful looking movie, even when you're watching it on, on VHS. Um, so we wanted to be inspired by that part of it too, and also to make it feel really contemporary and modern, and like we weren't, to us, like the point isn't to recreate that era, it's to feel inspired by, but to do something that could only exist with these actors in this time, in, in, in the Los Angeles of, of 2016, when, when we shot the movie. Um, so it was really important for us not to kind of get bogged down in that. But it's, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, I love VHS because it feels very alive to me. And of course, there's a problem with its, you know, not being in the correct aspect ratio most of the time, but it has a life to it. A lot of pan and scan on A lot of movies. pan and scan. Of course, scope movies on VHS are, you know, you're losing almost half of the frame. But what you do have is a liveliness to it. Like when you watch a DVD, it's just the most rigid kind of thing. And then a VHS has that kind of drift and, and breath to it that feels to me, more like 35 millimeter in some ways. Um, plus What's, you get the trailers and... Do you have a prize VHS? Well, mini prize VHS, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, it's hard to pick. Like your collector's one. item that you're most proud of? No, I don't have, they're not expensive, I don't have any expensive VHS. Um, you know, I, I like... And but four times seven though, you did like a lot. Oh yeah, I did, that one's in the frame. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. I have a copy of, of um, John Woo's A Better Tomorrow, um, which is, oh, it's actually a letterbox uh, of VHS, um, and that was the, the only way I've ever seen that movie. And um, it's also the print that it's taking from is really not that clean, and so it feels kind of like you're in a theater watching something with a lot of personality. So that's one I like. Uh, guys, I love Gemini. Congratulations on the film. Uh, when can so people much. see it? This Friday. This Friday? March 30th. March 30th in uh, in theaters? Yeah, in theaters in New York and Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, and then expanding beyond that the week afterwards will be in 30 more cities and then going from there. Fantastic. Go see it. It's a wonderful film. Everybody give a round of applause for Aaron, Lola, and John. Let's hear it.